In this video, I'm going to introduce the eigenspace, and we're going to do a proof of eigenvectors and distinct eigenvalues. Okay, so let's recall something. Let's recall that lambda is an eigenvalue of a if and only if the equation a minus lambda i x equals zero has a non-trivial solution. So the set of all solutions to that is going to be a subspace of Rn, and we're going to call it the eigenspace. So it's really just finding the null space of a minus lambda i x. So uh, that's really the same thing. So the eigenspace is just the null space of a minus lambda i for whatever value of lambda we choose. So it's important to remember that we find eigenspaces corresponding to eigenvalues. So remember, a matrix can have different eigenvalues. And if we don't put in a specific number, it's very hard to find an eigenspace because then we're just dealing with theoreticals. So uh, the eigenspace corresponds to an eigenvalue. OK, so let's find a basis for the eigenspace of A corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda equals 4. So we're finding, we're finding the solution to A minus 4i. So we want to find the null space of this. Okay, so a minus 4i. We have the matrix A here, so I'm just going to subtract 4 times the identity matrix from this. This will be 10 minus 4, negative 9, 4, and negative 2 minus 4. So clean this up right here. 10 minus 4 is going to be 6. Negative 2 minus 4 is going to be negative 6. Okay, so at this point, we can do some row reduction, so we can divide the top row by 3, we're going to get 2, negative 3, we'll divide the bottom row by 2, which will be 2 and negative 3. Oh, look at that, the top and bottom row are the same, so we're going to make the bottom row zeros. Okay, so at this point, uh, we know that 2x1 is going to be equal to 3x2, so we can divide both sides by 2, and we find our solution x1 is equal to 3 halves x2. So we can find a nice solution for this. So we have that the vector x is going to be equal to x2 times the vector 3 halves and 1. So I did skip a couple steps there, but if you're watching this video, you should be able to find a solution to the null space by now. So the vector x is equal to x2 times the vector 3 halves 1, which means that the eigenspace of a corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda equals 4 is going to be the vectors in the set of linear combinations here. So this is just going to be, uh, so we'll call this basis b, this is just going to be the vector 3 halves 1. So this basis only contains one vector. Okay, so if I had a 3 by 3, probably going to contain two vectors. 4 by 4, probably going to contain three vectors. Because remember, the eigenspace has a non-trivial solution. So one of those columns is going to be a non-pivot column, which wouldn't make sense if we had a 4 by 4 matrix to have four vectors in the basis. So let's keep that in mind when we're thinking theoretically about proofs here. Okay, but the big point of this video is this proof here. So if we have vectors v1 through vr and their eigenvectors corresponding to distinct eigenvalues, then the set of eigenvectors is going to be linearly independent. So we're going to do a proof by contradiction here. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that the set here, v1 all the way up to vr, is linearly dependent. Okay, so this is going to be a crucial assumption, and then we're going to show that we're going to get a contradiction. So, linearly dependent sets. So, we know that a set is linearly independent up to a point where we have a vector, P, that is a combination of all previous vectors. So, what we can do is we can say, okay, let's take our linearly independent vectors. So, we could say, okay, so this is going to be uh, c1 times v1 plus c2 times v2 all the way up to some vector cp 
times vp, and those vectors are going to be linearly independent. But the next vector, vp plus 1, is going to be dependent, which means it's a linear combination of all the previous vectors. So we can write vp plus 1 is equal to c1v1 plus c2v2 all the way up to cpvp. So uh, to annotate here, this is the first vector that's dependent. So I mean linearly independent here, I'm just not writing the word. Okay, so here is our equation and here's what we have so far. So what we can do is we can multiply this by the matrix A. Since we do have a matrix here, it's an eigenvector. So uh, more specifically, we have AX is going to equal, equal lambda X. So we can multiply this all by A. So here we're going to get AC1V1 plus AC2V2 all the way up to ACPVP. And this is going to equal A times V P plus one. Okay, so there is a very special property here of eigenvectors. And that is the fact that A times X is equal to the lambda times X. So this is the eigenvalue lambda times X, but these are all distinct values. So we gotta remember these are distinct values. So when we make this transformation from AX to lambda X, we're going to have lambda one c1v1 plus lambda 2 c2v2 all the way up to lambda p cpvp and that's going to equal to lambda p plus 1 v p plus 1. Okay so uh, this step is very important because the eigenvalues are distinct so we have to remind ourselves that these are not going to be the same lambdas. So when we take a matrix A and we get the corresponding eigenvalue, uh, this lambda one is never going to be equal to lambda two, never gonna be equal to lambda P, so on and so forth. Okay, so we have two equations here. We have our C1V1 all the way up to VP, and then we have our lambda C1V1. So what we can do is we can take this first equation here and we can just multiply everything by lambda P plus one. Okay, so let's do that. So let's take lambda P plus one C one V one plus lambda P plus one C two V two all the way up to lambda P plus one C P V P. And this is going to be equal to lambda P plus one V plus one. Okay, so you can kind of see why we did this. So what this means we have lambda p plus 1 v p plus 1 is equal to this lambda 1 c 1 v 1 all the way up to lambda p c p v p. But we have an equivalent statement here that says lambda p plus 1 v p plus 1 is equal to lambda p plus 1 c 1 v 1 plus lambda p plus 1 c 2 v 2. So if these two are actually equivalent, this means that lambda p plus 1 is going to equal lambda 1 lambda p plus 1 is going to equal lambda 2. So these are all going to be the same because we have these equations are the same. Okay, so here's what's interesting. If we subtract these two, so let's do some subtraction here. So our lambda p plus 1 v p plus 1 minus lambda p plus one v p plus one is going to be the zero vector. Okay, so for the rest of this, we are going to get, well, we're going to have c1 times lambda p plus one minus lambda one times v1. Uh, I'll cut out the v2 here. So this is plus cp lambda p plus one minus lambda p times the vector vp. Okay, so, we got rid of our linearly independent vector. So what this means, and we already assume this, is that V1 through VP are linearly independent. So this means that there's only the trivial solution. So what should happen here 
is we should have that lambda p plus 1 is equal to lambda 1 all the way up to lambda p plus 1 is equal to lambda p. So this should happen because we only have the trivial solution because v1 through vp are linearly independent. However, we assume that all the eigenvalues are distinct. So we know that lambda p plus 1 is not equal to lambda 1, and lambda p plus 2, or p plus 1 is not equal to lambda p. So that's not the only case. So we have not only the trivial solution, we have non-trivial solutions. And what does that mean? That means that v1 all the way up to vp are actually dependent. So these are actually linearly dependent. But that is a contradiction because we assumed first that this exact set or the subset of vectors is linearly independent. But then we got to the conclusion that it's dependent. So our first assumption here that v1 through vr is linearly dependent must be false. So this first assumption here, this is not true, which means that this set here is linearly independent, and that is the full proof. Okay, so uh, I'm going to do a quick verbal recap of what went on, because there's a lot of writing, a lot of explanation, and I didn't quite write out words for everything, so let's go through this very, very quickly here. Okay, first, v1 through vr are eigenvectors corresponding to distinct eigenvalues, then the set v1 through vr is linearly independent. So this is a proof by contradiction, so we assume it is dependent. We have the set v1 through vr which is dependent. We're taking a subsection of or a subset of vectors, v1 through vp, that are independent, and we're picking the next vector to be dependent. So we're finding that dependent vector, and everything before it is going to be independent. Okay, so we can rewrite that vp plus 1 as a linear combination of v1 through vp because these here are independent and the vp plus 1 is dependent. Okay, then we can multiply it by the matrix A and we know that Ax is equal to lambda x but they're all distinct values so we're going to get lambda 1 c1, lambda 2 c2 all the way up to lambda p cp. Uh, however, if we take our original equation and multiply everything by lambda p plus 1 uh, we get two equivalent statements here. So these two are equivalent statements. So what we do is we're going to subtract the first from the second, which means we're going to get here that c1 times lambda p plus 1 minus lambda 1 v1 all the way up to the vps is equal to 0, and this is linearly independent, which means that these lambda p plus 1s minus lambda 1s are going to equal 0. However, these values are distinct, so they're not going to equal 0. They're going to be some number that is not 0 which is a contradiction. Therefore, our original claim was false, and the set v1 through vr is going to be linearly independent. Okay, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Uh, crazy proof, probably one of the more complicated ones so far in the course, so hopefully you followed along. If not, ask your questions down below, and I'll do my best to answer them.